As James slept that night, he dreamed that Father Christmas came flying over his house in his sleigh, the bells jingling, the reindeer puffing and panting and snorting because they had come so far and so fast. He dreamed that Father Christmas was coming down the chimney with a sack full of presents over his shoulder and tiptoeing past Birdie, who was crawling at him from, the, from his basket. Then he was leaving lots of presents by the Christmas tree and coming up the stairs quickly into James's bedroom and filling up the stockings that Dad had left out on the end of the bed. His chubby face and red suit and white beard were covered in soot, but he was still smiling. He didn't seem to mind. As quickly as Father Christmas had come, he was gone again, and James could hear the jingling of the bells and puffing and panting and snorting of the reindeer. Diddy up, my beauties, he heard from outside. Diddy up, happy Christmas, James, happy Christmas. And the last of the jingling bells faded away into the night. James woke up, it was day. Grandma was calling out, Happy Christmas, everyone. It was Christmas Day, and there was his stocking at the end of the bed, stuffed full. James was out of bed quick as a twig. He snatched up his stocking and ran across the hallway to Grandma's room, bumping into Mom and Dad, both carrying their stockings, both looking sleepy, and then as they did every Christmas, they all climbed onto Grandma's bed and to open their stockings. Birdie had jumped up and was busy licking herself. He was allowed on beds on Christmas Day. Soon the bed was covered in torn wrapping paper and chocolates and socks and gloves and a drying up cloth and books and a toy racer and a packet of jelly babies and a Key ring with a red bus dangling from the end, and a lavender soap for Grandma, and a talcum powder for Mom, and after shave for Dad, and a David Bowie CD for Mom, and a DVD of Mamma Mia for Grandma, and another Paddington for James, and more chocolate, and lots, lots more. It wasn't long before all the unwrapping was over. And they were all contentedly sitting on Grandma's bed, stuffing their tangerines, which were always the last thing they put out for at the very bottom of their stockings. That was when Dad said, as he always did on Christmas morning, after the stockings had been opened and the tangerines eaten, well, James, I wonder what Father Christmas had left for us downstairs under the Christmas tree. James was first downstairs as he searched through the presents. His heart sank. There was nothing nearly big enough to be a mountain bike, nothing the right shape. He had a pencil taste from Mom, a woolly hat from someone. He'd already forgotten who a pair of bright red wellies from Dad and a hand-knitted Jumper from Grandma, but no mountain bike, no mountain bike. He was trying very hard not to look disappointed when Mom said, You do have one more little present, James. Father Christmas told us he hated wrapping it. It's a bit of an awkward shape, he said. So he just tied a ribbon around it and left it in the hall. Your dad... We'll fetch it in, won't you, dear? That was when Dad got up and, with the brothers of smiles on his face, went out of the room. Grandma told James to close his eyes. He did, but then he cheated and looked through his fingers. When Dad came back in, he was wheeling a bike, a bright green mountain bike with big fat tires. James jumped and down laughing and clapping his hands with joy. He said thank you and hugged everyone again and again. Bertie went bonkers, barking his silly head off. 
and chasing his tails. And of course, Grandma tried, which she often did when she was happy. I'm going to ride it right now. It's got big fat tires. It will go on the snow. I'm going to show my snowman. James said, already willing. The bike out of the room. Just before he left, he turned to his parents and said, Do you like my words? They were the snowman's present. He gave me words. Before they could say anything and before they could stop him, he was through the front door and out the house, still in pajamas. Then he was jumping on his bike and cycling away through the snow. There wasn't nearly as much snow now as there had been the day before. But even so, the bike slipped and slid around as James cycled across the garden, past the duck pond, through the gate, and out into oak tree field. Look what I've got, Mr. Snowman, he cried, struggling to control his slithering wheels in the slush and snow. Look at what Father Christmas brought me. And then James looked up. His snowman was nowhere to be seen. He looked all around. He was gone. His snowman had gone. James got off his bike, dropped it in the snow, and ran to where the snowman had been. All that was left of him was a pile of snow, a couple of Brussels sprouts, a tangerine, two apples, the green staff, and that's old hat. James ran out into the field, calling and calling for him. Come back, Mr. Snowman, come back. I need you, Mr. Snowman. I want to show you my bike. Please come back, come back. He listened for an answer, but there was none. Only the crows crowing from above him. Only the ducks crackling from the pond. James had lost his best friend, and suddenly he felt all alone in the wall. He didn't cry. He was too sad even for that. Then Kramer was beside him, her arms around him. He'll be back, James, she said. The next time it snows, you can make him all over again. So you haven't lost him. He's just gone away for a while. That's all. Didn't he give us a good time, James? Didn't he give us the best time ever? He won't forget. I won't forget. He won't forget. He'll be back next Christmas, probably. Maybe before. Whenever the snow comes again, and the snow always comes again, doesn't it? So he will too. You'll see.